Good afternoon, everyone. I'm Reverend Liz Walker, and I am honored to be your mistress of ceremony this evening, and I'm here to welcome you to this tribute to Roland Hayes. You can tell by the excitement and electricity in the room that this was a very electric and exciting man. We are going to celebrate his music and his story. We are celebrating the life of one of the great tenors of the 20th century. Roland Hayes was a consummate artist who influenced generations of musicians and music lovers around the world. And that accomplishment is made even more stunning by the fact that he was only one generation removed from legal slavery in this country. He overcame obstacles we can only read about. He persevered in ways we can only imagine. This brilliant, complex man left an extraordinary legacy. It is our hope that this afternoon you will experience some of that through story and song. This concert is presented by the Hidden Brookline Committee, an ad hoc group dedicated to bringing light to Brookline's hidden stories. And along with the town of Brookline's Office on Diversity, Inclusion, and Community Relations. We would also like to recognize and ask to stand briefly others who made this evening possible. Saul and Rachel Cohen and their foundation, please stand, and Hammond Realty. And Reverend Everall of this church, he was just walking around wherever you are. We would also like to welcome three distinguished leaders of the Brookline community, Board of Selectmen Ken Goldstein, Ben Franco, and Betsy DeWitt. A little biz business before we begin. There are three emergency exits. They're in the rear, at your right, and on your left. And then, is there another exit here? I think so. Just follow me. <laughs> Roland Hayes' musical education began as it has for many artists in his family, through his father, and then through his church. Perhaps that is why he loved Negro spirituals so much, or perhaps there was something more to that. It has been said that beautiful music is one of the most magnificent and delightful of God's gifts. So with that in mind, we begin this evening with the voices of the Brookline High School camaraderie.
Elijah Rock, shout, shout. Elijah Rock, coming up, Lord. Elijah Rock, shout, shout. Elijah Rock, coming up, Lord. Elijah Rock, shout, shout. When you are in the presence of such gifts, you should give them even more accolades. <laughs> that was beautiful. Thank you very much. Most of what I've learned about Roland Hayes has come from the book, Roland Hayes, The Legacy of an American Tenor. I am honored to add my voice to those who call it well-researched, comprehensive, and a revealing portrait of a musical genius. I'm also honored to present to you this afternoon the authors of that book, Christopher Brooks and Robert Sims. You've just heard a duet with Robert Sims, one of the premier interpreters of African American spirituals, and Roland Hayes on his recently released CD. Good afternoon, my name is Christopher Brooks, and this is Robert Sims.
Roland Hayes was once hailed as one of the greatest performers of the 20th century. This book, Roland Hayes, The Legacy of an American Tenor, offers a gripping, sensitive, and balanced account of this historical icon and musician. The story grapples with the realities of race, interracial liaisons, and the politics that often surrounded these and many other issues from the early 20th century through the 1970s. Roland Hayes always intended for his story to be told, but I believe that Robert Sims and I were chosen to tell this story because of the many events that took place once we embarked on this journey. I was drawn to Roland Hayes and his story because of his fierce determination to become one of the great concert singers of his time. And as in the spiritual, don't you let nobody turn you around, turn you around, turn you around. Roland Hayes didn't let nobody or nothing turn him around. He indeed became a legendary figure. He was an elegant singer with a beautiful legato, stunning mezza di voce, and masterful interpretive skills. Before every performance, his prayer was, Lord, blot out Roland Hayes so that they only see thee, therefore giving his audience not only high art, but a spiritual experience. Christopher Brooks and I traveled the United States, Europe, and Africa to find the Roland Hayes story. We examined over 100,000 Hayes personal papers at the Detroit Public Library. But we found another part of the Hayes story right here in Brookline. It was the nine boxes in Afrika Hayes Lamb's basement that brought Roland to life. From these boxes, I heard private recordings of Hayes' speaking and singing voice. In these boxes, we were introduced to the Countess, a member of the Habsburg dynasty and someone who would figure prominently in Hayes' life. Not only did the Countess coach Hayes in his concert repertoire, but because of her love for him and her mission to bear his son, she gave up the comfort of her aristocratic status. She believed that a son of royal African blood and European blood could be sent to Gandhi, the great Indian nationalist, to be raised and become a great leader, the Barack Obama of an earlier generation, if you will. <laughs> Although she had had four sons with the Count, to her surprise, she and Roland had a daughter who came to be called Maya. Maya did not enjoy a normal father-daughter relationship with Hayes. Most of their communications were by letter with the occasional visit once he was in Europe. She was, in fact, a mixed-race child born in an aristocratic society, yet she was treated as an outsider. Roland Hayes tried in vain several times to adopt his daughter but he returned to the United States to continue his career. He was well aware of the fact that a black man could be lynched for far less than an interracial relationship in this country. In 1954, as an adult married woman with twin sons, Maya saw her father for the last time and her five-year-old twins, Igor and Grishka, met their celebrated grandfather for the first and only time. Of all the players in the Roland and the Countess drama, Maya suffered the most. Within a span of five years, that is between 1977 and 82, Roland, the Countess, and the product of their union, Maya, were all gone. As an African-American concert singer, I have been fortunate to perform with many celebrated artists who were direct inheritors of the Hayes musical legacy, the legendary Odetta, William Warfield, and George Shirley. This year, I was able to record with my hero, Roland Hayes. One of the most unexpected outcomes of writing this book has been uniting 
Roland Hayes' family in Europe with their American cousins. And so the Roland Hayes story continues, and it continues to be written. And no doubt the legacy will, no, will continue to flourish. We enjoy traveling, doing interviews, researching, and ultimately telling the Roland Hayes story. We look forward to meeting you in the lobby where we will sign copies of our book, Roland Hayes, The Legacy of an American Tenor, and a companion CD at the conclusion of this program. Also, a special thanks to Dora Howe Taylor and her parents for making this opportunity possible for us. Thank you. Thank you both very much. And as I understand it, the authors have graciously brought copies for those wishing to buy at a discounted rate. So please take advantage of their generosity. There is much sermon material from Roland Hayes's life. I am a preacher. <laughs> That's what I do. If I were to preach about it this afternoon, I would begin by saying, while your past certainly speaks to your future. It obviously informs your future. It does not limit, define, or condemn you. That Roland Hayes lived in such a distinct shadow of slavery is a testament to his determination and perhaps to his destiny. You see, in the pulpit, I would say he was ordained for greatness. God had placed a hand on him, and it was already done when he was born. Can you say amen just a little louder over here? <laughs> praise the Lord, praise the Lord. His endurance, his boundless and hard-won confidence, those were all of the elements that despite his past, or, or perhaps because of it, led him to such greatness, such an extraordinary light in the world. He was not limited by anything. He struggled, but his struggle was both the root and the wings of his destiny. And so the message there is, don't let nobody turn you around. Don't let nothing turn you around. Roland Hayes was deeply aware of the importance of history. He worked feverishly and diligently to ensure that his story would be clearly told. He was a spiritual man and knew that his gift was from God. And it is that history and that calling that speak most profoundly to me today. This day is important not only because of what we are hearing and what we see, but also it is important because of our vow to always remember. That is the purpose, that is the call that binds us together today to make sure Roland Hayes is formally memorialized in this community. Mr. Hayes moved through the world profoundly through song and word. That is a gift that, with our help, can live on forever. Ladies and gentlemen, I am pleased and honored to present to you the joyful voices of inspiration.
Well, thank you all very much. And now, ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Barbara Brown from Hidden Brookline. It is so good to see everybody here. Uh, it's been a wonderful year of planning. And now what we're doing is we are presenting to you a documentary that was aired 25 years ago on PBS um, called The Musical Legacy of Roland Hayes. And we, it's an hour long, and we had the difficulty of selecting a seven minute excerpt. So it's just a taste. If you want to borrow it, come see a member of the Hidden Brookline Committee um, because we can lend you a copy. And um, before you, we see the seven minute excerpt, I want to introduce a woman who has come from Maryland just for this concert. And she was the producer. And not only the producer, she told me I did everything. Um, like many women. And so I'd like to introduce Deborah Mims and ask her to stand, please. And this man was a superstar. He was known the world over. He gave Marian Anderson her first opportunity when she was a young girl to sing in Philadelphia. She sang a group of songs in one of his concerts. He was a man who never, in spite of his fame and fortune, never turned his back on his people. He championed the music of his peers. Hayes traveled throughout America, primarily in the South singing mainly in black churches. But to improve his art and to gain recognition in his own country for his talents, he had to go to Europe. On April 23, 1920, Roland Hayes sailed for England with his accompanist, Lawrence Brown, aboard the SS Mauritania. His progress in England was slow at first. But as his circle of friends grew larger and news of his talent spread, he was increasingly in demand. On April 21st, 1921, he gave a concert in London's prestigious Wigmore Hall. The following day, he received a summons from King George V and Queen Mary to give a private concert for them at Buckingham Palace. Of course, that was a singular honor for him because no black man had ever been um, awarded anything like that. Uh, he had been very ill, I believe it was with, with pneumonia, at the time the summons uh, came for him to perform in front of the king and queen. And I guess the shock of it, um, he said he completely fainted when he, uh, <laughs> when he received word that he was to be uh, presented uh, to the king and queen. However, Hayes did not always meet with immediate acceptance. In the fall of 1924, while Hayes prepared for a concert in Berlin, a German newspaper editorial called for the prevention of a certain calamity, the concert of an American Negro who had come to Berlin to defile the name of the German poets and composers. A Negro, the writer said, who at best could only remind us of the cotton fields of Georgia. My father told me at the time he was performing in Berlin, it was something that had never been done by a serious black artist. Uh, of course, Berlin had seen uh, you know, the, uh, what I call them, the Bojangles and the, uh, so forth and so on. So they didn't think that any black man or black woman, for that matter, could sing uh, serious music. Hayes later wrote about this experience. When I entered the concert chamber at the Beethoven Saal, I found myself standing in a flood of light. From the rear, there rolled out a great volley of hisses, which seemed to fill the hall entirely. I was terribly apprehensive 
But I took my place in the curve of the piano, closed my eyes, lifted my head into position, and stood as still as a statue. I waited moment after moment, perhaps five or ten minutes altogether. No one came to my defense on this occasion as far as I could hear. But presently, the attack upon me petered out. When the silence came, the hall was as still as any I had ever sung in. I conveyed my readiness to my accompanist with the slightest movement of my lips without turning my head or body and began to sing Schubert's Du bist die Ruhe. The entry to that song is as silent as silence itself. A German text stealing out of my mouth seemed to win my hostile audience. Almost before he could finish the song, those that had started to boo and hiss remained to cheer. After the concert, Hayes said the first person to speak to him in the artist room was an American boy who was studying music in Berlin. His face was as red as a beet and his eyes shone darkly. God damn it, he said, put it there. This is the first time I have seen the Germans admit that good art can come out of America. Hayes maintained a schedule of touring throughout America each winter and spring, and studying and performing in Europe in the summer and fall. A friend captured him on film in France in 1927. Hayes was now one of the highest paid singers in the world. For the remainder of the decade, his engagements on the continent took him to France, Germany, Austria, Spain, Italy, and the Soviet Union. He was lionized on the continent. And this why Roland Hayes was the consummate artist. He could sing the most lovely Adelaide and the Germans were just, just about swoon. And then he would come right back with the same audience and sing a, sing a thing, wasn't it a pity and a shame? And he never said a mumbling word, which, which would just, you know, just about tear your heart out. And what I'm contending is the basic man who could sing a spiritual that way also could take on a cultured art and get the same kind of result from it. In 1932, while in California performing at the Hollywood Bowl, he married Alzada Mann, and they had a daughter, Afrika Fanzada. The Hayes family lived in a home in Brookline, Massachusetts. I like the way that kind of ends in a upmoat, and here we are. Who best to speak, or who better to speak, of the musical genius of one man than another extraordinary musician? Robert Honeysucker really needs no introduction. Renowned for his interpretation of vocal music, Mr. Honeysucker is a winner of the National Opera Association competition and the New England Opera Club Jacopo Perry Award. He has performed uh, all over the world in symphony orchestras, including the Boston Symphony Orchestra, the De Detroit Symphony, and the Tokyo Philharmonic. His accomplishments are really too many to mention here today. Mr. Honeysucker is a member of the voice faculty at the Boston Conservatory and the Langey School of Music of Bard College. And he taught my baby to sing. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, Mr. Robert Honeysucker.
few months ago, I had the, um, the uh, opportunity to give a recital in, uh, in Harlem, New York, at a church in Harlem. And, and at that uh, concert were several, several young uh, African American singers uh, because they you know how they come, you know how they come, just go about the very much and see how they're doing. And so, and compare, you know, I can do better than that. So, so uh, but after the concert, uh, the title, the several of them came up and um, congratulated me and, uh, you know, for the performance. And one young man came up to, uh, and said to me, I, I just want to thank you for you're paving the way for me to have this, you know, to do what I'm doing. And I was flattered and I smiled and I said, well, thank like, you, keep doing it. And I know I keep working on it and improving. I wish you well. And after he left, I, I said, why did that be? I didn't do anything. Uh, I'm just a part of a line that, that, that followed the same, that followed the path of so many like Warfield and those who formed the, the Warfield and all followed that same path that was blazed by Roman Hayes. So the thanks should go to well, Mr. Hayes. And so today I, I was asked to say a few words and, and basically all I'm here to say is thank you, Mr. Hayes. Um, I had the opportunity as this walk and said to sing in, in places far and wide in this country and others and and, and as, the, as the documentary shows us, so much of this is made possible by the path that he made. Thank you, Mr. Hayes. Um, I've had the privilege to sing with several times with the DSO, uh, an opportunity that so many others before me have, have uh, had the opportunity to do, but one that certainly had as its, as its uh, uh, Leadership that we were the first one to pave the way for us was Mr. Hayes. So thank you, Mr. Hayes. And finally, um, I've got a little talk about this. Uh, um, <clears throat> I had the opportunity to meet him, thanks to Africa, uh, at a concert in Georgia uh, uh, shortly after I arrived in Boston. And, um, and I was a student, and uh, so, you know, you thought it was a student, you're trying to work this, it's all the day in school, you're trying to work so hard to perfect the craft, and build a craft, and all my bucket list was, I need to go and talk to Roman Hayes and sit down with him and talk to him and thank him and find out everything, everything he, you know, he knew, and, and the bucket list was there, and he passed before it got this. The thing, the person. So, Dave, a free friend, family, just a piece. Thank you.
Governor Michael Dukakis and Kitty Dukakis both knew Roland Hayes uh, when the two of them were growing up here in Brookline. Since the governor and Mrs. Dukakis could not be here today, they're in California, um, they generously offered to send us their comments and their views about Roland Hayes from many years ago here in Brookline. Thank you. Uh, my dad was a first violinist and, and associate conductor of the Boston Symphony and Boston Pops. And he became very close to Roland Hayes and very angry at the town when he discovered that Roland could not buy a house in, in Brookline. That he could buy a house through a straw but it was just outrageous. And so he spoke with other members of the orchestra and they agreed uh, that they would do something. And then eventually Roland was able to find um, In fact, he a couldn't house. even buy a house through a store. Yeah, at the beginning. Yeah. What happened was that uh, he had sung, apparently, at the home of um, a longtime resident of the town who admired him and respected him a lot. And when he passed away, that is when the owner of the house passed away, uh, Roland Hayes apparently wrote his daughter in California and said, might it be possible for me to purchase the house in which I spent so much time and so many good hours performing? And she wrote back and said, uh, I can't think of any person that my father would more like us to sell this house to than you, Roland. So the Hayes became the only African-American family that lived in the town of Brookline when we were kids, except for a couple of janitor's families who lived in the basement of apartment buildings. That was Boston and Massachusetts and the United States of America when we grew up. People of color simply didn't live in the town. But I mean, that was, that was this country. People talk about the good old days. And, the golden 50s and that kind of stuff. And now, I, I was lucky enough in high school to have as one of my homeroom classmates Afrika Hayes, the daughter of Roland Hayes. But um, she was one of a handful of African-American uh, uh, students 
in a very real sense, Roland Hayes was a pioneer, and yet um, our own town really didn't come anywhere near taking real pride and honor in the fact that he was one of our residents. I, I never remember that happening as I look back. So if people want to know whether or not we're making progress, yeah, we'll make the answer is yes. Do we have more to do? A lot more wow. to do. But it's a very different community from the one that um, the Hayes lived in back in the 40s and 50s and 60s when we were growing up. And it wasn't really until the late 60s that activists in the town, we were among them, began pushing very hard to bring these barriers down. Mm -hmm. But in that sense, uh, Roland Hayes was very unusual in addition to the fact that he was an internationally renowned singer and uh, tenor. tenor and highly admired and respected worldwide. That's our kitty, that's our kitty. We have been talking about legacies this afternoon, this evening, and now we are thrilled and honored to present the living, breathing legacies of Roland Hayes. Please acknowledge and welcome the Hayes family. Won't you stand? make a very special introduction, I am honored to present Roland Hayes' daughter, Afrika Hayes Lamb.
legacy is alive and well. We thank you all for coming this afternoon. I believe we have all shared something extraordinary. I want to remind you that this concert is the opening step toward creating a permanent memorial to Roland Hayes in Brookline. You're going to be hearing a lot more about that. I'd also like to encourage you to fill out an insert that you will find in your program. There are some questions that we are asking you about this afternoon's event and about some other things. And we also want to remind you that the authors will be selling their compelling biography of Roland Hayes at a discounted rate at the end of this program. If you're planning to purchase the book, I'm told you're to form a line in the aisle on my right, your left, on my left, your right. Just when you see somebody in front of you, stand behind them. Thank you all for coming and be blessed. Bye, everybody.